Introduction In the sphere of business, whether you are a one-man operation or a multi-billion dollar conglomerate, growth is something that is never far from the top of the to-do list. It is the natural path of progression that a business wants, increasing your loyal customer base, improving your infrastructural flexibility, entering new markets, diversifying your product lines, and maximizing your profit margins are all elements of growth that are essential for long-term success and perpetual growth. In the highly competitive environment of modern business, a common mantra is, grow fast or die quickly. And while that may sound dramatic, it is something that every business professional should remember and revisit. That being said, given that every business is trying to grow and the market, for all intents and purposes, is limited simply by customer populations, every company lands on the spectrum of success or failures in terms of growing their business. Inevitably, every business that lasts in their respective market for more than a year or so will likely feel that they are growing in a successful way. The proof of their solid strategy is simple in their survival. At this point, companies often become stagnant, satisfied with their pace of growth and their place within their market. In other words, they follow the if-it-ain't-broke-don't-fix-it attitude. While this may keep a company afloat, growing at a respectable pace and balancing infrastructural expansion with demand, this is not the attitude of top-tier companies who never allow themselves to be satisfied with where they are or what they have achieved. Ambition and focused drive are the foundation of growth, and these characteristics alone can often push a company towards impressive success. However, ambition and determination are rather vague and subjective qualities. The real business success stories of recent years go much further, achieving an almost manic level of motion, progress, and flexibility. These titans of modern times are more than focused on growth. They are growth engines. Some of the fastest growing companies in business are those whose names are splashed across media outlets and stock market recaps, while others quietly make their leaps and bounds to the top of their industry largely unnoticed, choosing to focus on perpetuating their own success rather than ensuring that the world hears about it. Being classified as a growth engine is an elite nomination, but with tens of thousands of listed businesses operating globally and millions of other unlisted companies, growth engines are more common than one might expect. Growth engines are more common than one might expect. For the purposes of this short instructional book, a handful of diverse companies are highlighted and dissected to reveal what particular strategies they employed to achieve such notable success in relatively short amounts of time. A great deal of business literature has been written about growth, as everyone seems to have their own secret strategy of what works and why, but one often wishes that the flood of advice givers' wisdom could be reduced to a simplified and widely applicable method for success and effective growth. Fortunately, by tracking the methodology and progress of growth engines, overlapping strategies and commonalities become clear, logically suggesting the best path towards growth despite the inherent subjectivity of growth for the diverse range of business on the market today. Perhaps the best place to start in terms of big-picture strategies is a focus on sales, the art of the transaction. As this is the fundamental moment of profit creation and customer interaction, a significant amount of time should be dedicated to this process, whether you are an established business with millions of global customers or a nascent enterprise trying to carve out a minute niche within an industry. There is a misconception that success is directly correlated to complexity and a ferocious attention to detail, and while these things certainly contribute to success, those aspects of your attention shouldn't supersede the point of sale, nor the relentless effort to improve and increase your sales opportunities. Particularly for small businesses, increasing the amount of face time with customers and seeking out new, innovative opportunities to find fresh customers and expand your base of loyal followers is essential. You may have a brilliant product, an aesthetically gorgeous display or shop design, and a talented, outside-of-the-box thinking staff, but none of that directly translates into sales unless you, quite simply, get people into your store and close deals. 
Competitor companies with lower quality products may outpace you day in and day out if they have implemented strategies and trained employees to sell those products better. Basically, you could be the innovator behind the next big thing, but if you can't make a sale, then all of your hard work will have been for naught. There used to be a rather stark divide in business between companies that required excellent salesmanship skills and those that didn't. Times have definitely changed, and the skill of salesmanship has never been more in demand across every industry. Refocusing your efforts on experimenting with sales techniques will do far more for you in the long run than obsessing about product details and the banal details of administration and infrastructure. Establishing solid sales protocols will consequently bring in more business, revealing which elements of your company actually require additional attention. With a large influx of orders, you might find the cracks in your distribution network or manufacturing department, major issues to fix that you wouldn't know about until they were quite literally tested in the field. By placing the concept of sales at the center of your business model, your workforce will similarly adopt that mindset, resulting in their creative energies being directed towards innovating salesmanship in valuable ways. Obviously, a company needs more than good salesmen to capture, hold, and expand a segment of the market, but there should always be energy directed at sales at every point of a company's life cycle to ensure growth. Some of the more philosophical approaches to growth that companies hungry for expansion should adopt may appear to have less direct effects on growth, but as mentioned above, changing a mindset can be a powerful means of affecting change and ringing in a new era for a given business. The idea of embarking on a business venture without establishing a plan may seem like folly to many academics and old guard business professionals. However, as we've seen with many startup companies, creating a desirable product and releasing it to the world before any formal plan or infrastructure is in place can often be the smartest and most intimidating strategies for growth. Competition is so fierce, and innovations are quickly riffed off and emulated, that holding back and waiting for every little detail of a product or business launch to be perfect can be a fatal mistake. Although this may not be the terminology espoused in business school lecture halls across the world, many of the fastest-growing companies look for people with the capacity for GSD, getting shit done, rather than those who are constantly second-guessing or planning for every eventuality. Diving into a new industry or idea headlong is often what results in making the biggest splash, and that initial shock and awe tactic can easily result in consistent, sustainable growth. The start-now, plan-later tactic may seem foolish to some, but consider companies like Google or CEOs like Richard Branson and Elon Musk, who regularly leap into ventures that seem improbable or foolhardy, only to find astronomical success based on that precise willingness to entertain the idea of the impossible. When you're breaking new ground or moving into territory previously unexplored, there is no way to know the right strategy for success. Essentially, once more referencing my favorite late great author, Kurt Vonnegut, we have to continually be jumping off cliffs and developing our wings on the way down. In the same vein as starting first and planning later, pursuing the impossible is one of the best ways to stimulate growth, but not in the sense of creating something that the world has never seen. It is easy to fall into the mindset that your company has reached a saturation point in the market or that you've leveled out. However, there are no rules governing how big a company can grow, and you need to eliminate the mindset that your venture is restricted in any way. For example, consider your initial dreams for your company when you were first embarking on your journey into the business world. Many of those ambitions probably fell by the wayside as hard realities began to rise up in your path. However, dismissing those ideas permanently is self-sabotage. They were swimming around in the same waters as ideas you implemented, so why are they deemed impossible or disposable while other plans and dreams have formed on the backbone of your company? The constant pursuit of the new often clouds a company's ability to look at the cutting room floor of the past.
at different stages of growth and development of a company. Earlier obstacles have often been overcome, which means that those ideas or ambitions that were dismissed should come back to the table. There shouldn't be a mentality of permanence dictating your decisions. What once was deemed unrealistic may be precisely where you need to return to push forward. Those ideas were good enough to warrant a discussion at one point in time. What's the harm in revisiting them once the capital base, infrastructure, and workforce capability has changed? Shying away from the seemingly impossible ideas is the mark of a stagnant company, one that lacks the vision and ambition to grow. While a firm focus on sales, the start now, plan later methodology and the pursuit of the impossible can stimulate sizable growth for your company, one of the best ways to shift your thinking to higher levels of productivity is by forcing yourself to face your limitations. Imagine for a moment that you want to double your gross profits by the end of the month. Your immediate reaction may be to say that it is impossible. There's that word again. But ask yourself why it seems so impossible. Do you lack the capital to expand your marketing and production levels? Is your workforce out of sync with company values? Is your infrastructure still too fragile and faulty to boost production, distribution, and sales that quickly? There could be dozens of reasons why you're unable to make that jump to the next level. Identifying them and proactively working towards fixing them is the wisest thing to do before pushing for more growth. Understanding your limitations to growth and solving them before making a major push will guarantee success when you try to expand effectively. Once you identify and overcome the obstacles to doubling your gross profit, think bigger. What would need to change to transform your $10 million business into a $100 million heavyweight? What if you wanted to make that change in six months, a year? Recognizing and accepting the different needs and pitfalls that will inevitably rise in your company's future will make it less of a surprise when you reach that point. Ideally, you would have planned for those issues and your growth process can be smooth and seamless. To put it simply, think bigger, be bigger. These general techniques, both tangible and philosophical, are tried and true methods for stimulating and sustaining growth. Major growth engines employ most or all of these focal points in their business model, tailoring them to fit within their framework. Most importantly, growth engines never turn off. They never reach a goal and then sit back on their haunches and wait for the competitors to start nipping at their heels once again. Success and milestones are certainly times for celebration, but that doesn't mean that those companies ease off the accelerator. A growth engine, just like the engine in your car, is defined by a simple, inalterable purpose to keep one, moving. The Legend of Lululemon In 1998, a small store named Lululemon appeared for the first time in a small neighborhood outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. On the surface, it was a small independent retailer of athletic clothes geared toward women, specifically those who actively practiced yoga. The store was also conveniently connected to a yoga studio. Whether the company's CEO, Dennis Wilson, had the foretelling abilities of legendary swamis of the past is unclear, but the idea of an athletic apparel company inspired by yoga and aimed at women could not have come along at a better time. Although yoga has been practiced for thousands of years, there has been a sharp increase in the amount of yoga studios and practitioners in the Western world over the past two decades. This has largely been in response to the rise of health and nutritional awareness, as well as the interest in alternative treatments and practices that don't require dieting, nutritional supplements, or formal medical treatment. Lululemon arrived on the scene at the perfect time, filling a much-needed gap in the market that the traditionally male-dominated athletic apparel industry simply overlooked or dismissed as a fad. Within three years, Lululemon had made its way to New York and was already swelling impressively for a small retail chain. 
In just over a decade, Lululemon went public, boasting more than 100 retail locations and approximately $350 million in annual revenue, including an unbelievable $1,800 per square foot of retail space, roughly triple what other high-end apparel retailers set as a space profit ratio goal. This splash in the marketplace has raised a number of corporate eyebrows, and their business model has come under intense scrutiny and admiration from companies around the world. Lululemon's success can be attributed to many things, but their ability to establish trust, attract fiercely loyal customers, and use those connections to perpetually expand their business is the foundation for their unprecedented growth. Although the word cult usually has a negative connotation, that is the best way to describe the passionate personnel and followers of this standout brand. The company's hiring policy initially only applied to yogis, those who understood the physical needs and mindset of their target customers. The employees were informed, engaged, and enlightened, sincerely believing in the value of the products and the philosophy upon which the store was based. Self-actualization and personal growth are constantly promoted within the sales staff, many of whom who work as yoga instructors near the retail locations or even run classes in yoga studios attached to retail locations. This dual nature of the store's sales staff encouraged a cyclical relationship with consumers and given the intimate nature of yogic practices, an immediate bond of trust between yogi, saleswoman, and student consumer is established. Their employees are called educators, and with good reason. They are required to undergo more than 30 hours of training and an intense interview process, which includes seeing them teach a yoga class. Outside of the walls of the retail location, Lululemon also sends reconnaissance teams to every city where they are looking to establish a new location in order to find the most talented, energetic, and popular yogis. For example, before they entered the New York market, Lululemon staff members sat in on more than 500 yoga classes before choosing their ideal representatives. These yogis were approached to be ambassadors for the company, not only receiving free apparel, but also a life-sized poster in their local Lululemon retailer, effectively making them a local celebrity and driving additional business to their studio. Their studios became satellite marketing spots. The yogis wear the apparel and urge their students to join the Lululemon cult. They even welcome Lululemon representatives to sell apparel directly in their studios, solidifying the relationship between practitioner, students, and the increasingly dominant retailer. Their clothing is definitely considered high-end, with some leggings priced upwards of $90, but these price tags don't seem to dissuade customers from consistently spending money there, investing in themselves and their hobby. The educators are encouraged to develop personal connections with their loyal shoppers, helping them move towards their own personal goals in fitness and in life. There is even an interactive, supportive online network of customers where they can post their progress towards their fitness goals. The entire system is geared towards selling products, and the educators are masters at it, but when you walk into a retailer, it doesn't feel like you're being sold to. Instead, it is like walking into a karmic utopia where everyone is helping and supporting one another, even if that means recommending the flow white sports bra over the free-to-be. Aside from sales, Lululemon demonstrates another of the key concepts of massive growth engines, expansion to new markets, and perpetual evolution. They may have begun with yoga, but they quickly expanded to running gear and are now aiming to corner the market on triathlons and swimming. The only obstacle that they face with this new expansion strategy is the lack of an existing network of yogis to act as educators and freelance marketers, but as with every other challenge they faced, this growth engine shows no sign of backing down from their ambitious plans or slowing their Chapter pace two. to the top. Open Sesame for Alibaba Although a great deal of international attention lies on the economic clout of the West, the largest market in the world is actually to the East, China. 
The People's Republic has been the fastest growing economy for the past three decades, is the second largest economy on the planet, and is also the global leader in manufacturing and exportation of goods. These impressive ranks make China one of the most attractive markets for companies, particularly retailers, given that the population of China is nearly 1.4 billion. While recent decades have seen thousands of entreaties to China by companies from countries all over the world, establishing a firm foothold can be challenging, as the country is a strange mixture of communism and unfettered capitalism, protecting its sovereign interests above all else. The complexities of business in China prevents certain companies from gaining ground there, despite the massive potential for sales and business growth. In 1999, amidst the international squabbling for chunks of China's swelling economy, Jack Ma launched Alibaba from his apartment, where he began connecting Chinese manufacturers to potential business customers all over the world in an effort to expand China's global reach without many of the complications of brick-and-mortar establishments and regulations on the mainland. The beginnings of Alibaba were humble, to say the least, but presently, Alibaba holds the title of the highest IPO in history at $25 billion, achieved less than 15 years after the company took its first nascent steps. To achieve this monumental growth in such a short time, a bold vision was required, and Ma never stopped dreaming big. Perhaps the meaning of impossible is lost in translation to Chinese. He began by connecting businesses to each other with his online marketplace, or bazaar as the literally inspired name implies, but that placed an immediate limitation on what Alibaba could become. Business-to-customer functionality was added, followed by consumer-to-consumer -consumer transactions. Alibaba quietly spread and eventually came to dominate China's e-commerce industry. Estimates are that 80% of all online transactions in the country were handled through the Alibaba Group, and 60% of all parcel deliveries in China were in some way connected to the company. Jack Ma both emulated and improved existing versions of online services in the West. The business-to-consumer element of the Alibaba Group occurs on Tmall, while consumer-to-consumer -consumer interactions take place on Taobao. These two flagship web portal enterprises of the Alibaba Group brought in more than 1 trillion yuan in 2012, $170 billion. This is more than Amazon, business-to-consumer platform, and eBay, consumer-to-consumer -consumer platform, brought in during the same year, combined. Alibaba Group learned from its limited mistakes on its B2B platform, Alibaba, and improved the functionality of each successive flagship site, fixing problems that Western e-commerce juggernauts were too invested in to fix, such as free product listings for businesses and consumer sellers. Furthermore, one of the most important, impossible advances by this company was a banking program called Alipay. Launched in 2004, it functioned much like a PayPal of the East, but with far more functionality that was customized to Chinese culture and mindset. Credit card use is not as rampant in China, as the idea of spending money one doesn't have seems somewhat foreign or threatening. Secondly, the security concerns between buyers and sellers has been a problem with eBay and Amazon in the past. So Alipay features an escrow system, which means that the money isn't released to the seller until the buyer receives their product in the agreed-upon condition. Although Chinese companies are notoriously incompatible with Western forms of payment, Alibaba and Alipay are partnered with major Western companies like Visa and MasterCard, opening up their services to hundreds of millions of more consumers outside of its country's borders, something that its competitors don't necessarily offer. In terms of achieving the impossible, Alibaba is even challenging its own country by offering an alternative to the legendary low interest rates of Chinese banks, which allows the country to attract trillions of dollars in investments and only return a minimal amount of interest. Alibaba is now offering a service called Yuebao for investors with interest rates twice as high as China's national banks. 
Not only is the Alibaba Group offering comprehensive B2B, B2C, and C2C functionality for the world, it is also stimulating nationwide banking reform in one of the most stubborn and unyielding economic systems in the world. When it comes to its activities growth engine, the astronomical rise of Alibaba and its success in drawing the international spotlight speaks for itself. Yahoo invested $1 billion into the Alibaba group back in the mid-2000s, and on the day that Alibaba released its IPO on the NYSE, Yahoo's stocks, purchased primarily as a proxy for Alibaba, was the most traded stock in the world. Through sheer ambition, intelligent design, and the simplification of the buying and selling process, Alibaba has capitalized on most of the major factors for growth engines. Jack Ma has bucked the trends of international e-commerce and put an infrastructural framework in place that enabled the company to grow at whatever pace the unique and beneficial services naturally settled into. If economic analysts are correct, Alibaba will become and remain one of the most powerful and influential companies in the world, largely because it epitomizes the characteristics of a titanic Chapter growth three. engine. The Carrick Green Mountain Climber In the international coffee game, it is often difficult to get past the green and white giant that is Starbucks. But when it comes to being a growth engine, Starbucks isn't the only caffeinating champion. Carrick Green Mountain, formerly Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, has risen to rather elite status in the coffee drinking world, largely due to its Carrick pods, which make instant one cup coffee in minutes that far surpasses the quality of most instant coffee options. Not only that, but they've managed to partner with some of the biggest names in beverages on the planet, vaulting them to the limelight of this multi billion dollar industry in a very short time. Green Mountain Coffee Roasters has been around since 1981, but it wasn't until their acquisition of Keurig in 2006, the single-cup manufacturing company. Green Mountain Coffee Roasters had made a name for itself as a high-end coffee brand that led the way in the organic and fair trade trends that have become so dominant in recent years. However, at this point in their history, they were rather unremarkable, another of Starbucks' many competitors on the shelves. Their status as a growth engine was reached in the past decade when the convenience of Kerrig's one-pod system was combined with Green Mountain Coffee Roasters' more than 100 varieties of coffee. While neither one pod coffee nor a company with extensive coffee varieties was revolutionary, the combination was, and their business exploded. They finally established a cheaper and more convenient option for high-end coffee drinkers who would typically add an extra 10-minute Starbucks tax to their morning commute. That bid for a competitive advantage over a coffee bean behemoth was ambitious enough, but the real genius of Green Mountain Coffee Roasters came later. Adopting the proverbial, if you can't beat them, join them mentality, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters agreed to allow Starbucks to sell its coffee in Carrick compatible pods. In exchange, Starbucks would sell Carrick machines in their retail locations, of which they have more than 20,000. This was advantageous for both companies, but while Starbucks eased some competition and nibbled a portion of Kerrig's profits by getting into the one-cup pod game, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters' Kerrig machines were now associated with one of the major players in the industry and also had massive amounts of exposure to their ideal target market, coffee drinkers who had refined taste. After this partnership went into effect, Carrig arranged for a similar setup with Dunkin' Donuts, who was typically placed at the other end of the coffee spectrum. By offering a cheaper option than Starbucks and a slightly more expensive option than Dunkin' Donuts, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters arguably pulled off the most successful industry invasion in recent history, partnering with two rival giants and placing their products just where they needed to be. 2010 was a banner year for the company, and their stocks reached a record high, which has since been surpassed, largely because of the exposure gained from their new powerhouse partners.
as always competitors arose to the challenge when their intellectual property rights ran out on their one pod system competitors were able to offer Kerrig compatible pods for lower prices which represented a major threat to green mountain coffee roasters as their success relied on the production roasting and distribution of coffee as well as the technology to produce one cup convenience the Kerrig 2.0 was the saving grace of the company solving the issue that many coffee drinkers disliked about the technology the one cup nature of the pods the Kerrig 2.0 could make an entire pot of coffee and that technological change also meant that green mountain coffee roasters had their intellectual property rights back once more leaving competitors far behind with this new release the company climbed back into a dominant position in the market having creatively and some might say semantically eliminated their competitors foothold the company's connection to starbucks and dunkin donuts was certainly a boost for their exposure and respectability but there is one name in global beverage production that throws around more weight than any other coca-cola in 2014, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters partnered with the undisputed leader in global refreshment, and Coca-Cola bought a 10% stake in the company. They are jointly developing a cold beverage system that will enable the more than 1 billion Coca-Cola drinkers around the world to create their own Coke products from the comfort of their own home. The next month, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters wisely changed their name to reflect what has already become their cornerstone technology and is now called Kerrig Green Mountain. At the time of this writing, Kerrig's stock has already soared by more than 80% in the year 2014, which is an unbelievable amount of growth in a single year for a company that has been in business for more than three decades. The Coca-Cola partnership has put Kerrig on the global stage in a way that even their connection with Starbucks was unable to deliver. With record-setting profits already under their belt and additional partnerships with other companies, including another giant, Kraft Foods, flowing in, Kerrig Green Mountain is positioned to infiltrate the distribution networks of some of the most powerful names in the business. In terms of their specific strategies as a growth engine, Kerrig Green Mountain flipped the idea of competition on its head, whereas most small companies that pose a threat to larger, more established businesses are acquired or absorbed, Kerrig's patented technology made them a potential partner rather than a threat. Through their own acquisition and subsequent improvement of a disruptive technology, they became more valuable as an ally than an enemy, while still avoiding being bought out. Although some speculation exists that Coca-Cola will eventually buy the entire company, given their recent stock success, that purchase price could exceed $10 billion, which is still 20 times higher than their current annual profits. The company's ambition and unwillingness to take the money and run has allowed it to jump into the elite echelon of international beverage distributors and retail corporations in a way that most companies can only dream of. They didn't back down from major corporations trying to edge them out of a market, nor did they allow themselves to fade into obscurity when their innovative edge waned. They changed the rules again and made themselves invaluable partners to pillars of the industry. Not every growth engine can last forever, and Carrick Green Mountain could very well be absorbed by a massive company like Starbucks in the coming years, but its policies and practices that have allowed it to reach such hollowed heights can be an inspiration to any small business that is ready to take the step in their Chapter corner four, of the market. Powering the World one of the most important issues facing the world today is the depletion of natural resources coupled with the ever-increasing demand for those resources as countries across the world continue to modernize. This crisis, an appropriate term for the situation, is exacerbated by the undeniable havoc on the environment that global society's gluttonous use of fossil fuels continues to wreak. Socially and environmentally conscious companies across the globe have shifted their attention to more sustainable energy solutions, some eagerly and others begrudgingly. 
the Green Revolution is gradually demanding the attention and investment of the world as its benefits become more apparent and the need for more considerate and sustainable energy use becomes obvious. This shift in thinking has led to the formation and success of many new industries, including alternative energy sources, wind power, solar power, hydrogen power research facilities, and dozens of other green sectors of the global economy. However, many of these industries are simply expansions on technology that has already existed. While they are crucial to raising awareness and stimulating changed mentalities around the world, their progress has been slower than many would have hoped. Tweaking old technologies works for some companies, and plenty have found economic success, but there have been very few revolutionary innovations to point to within this vital sector of modern life. Elon Musk, however, has never been one to ride the coattails of greater men, with one notable exception, Nikola Tesla. Musk is the CEO and product architect of Tesla Motors, one of the most exciting and controversial companies on the planet. As the company's namesake implies, they produce electric cars and electric vehicle powertrain components in the hopes of shifting the massive global automotive industry in a more sustainable and eco-friendly direction. Their vehicles are powered by an AC motor that is directly inspired by Nikola Tesla's oft-forgotten invention of more than 130 years ago. The company was founded in 2003, and its blue-sky ambitions were dismissed by major automotive players as an impossible dream, and for the better part of a decade, it seemed that they may be right. The company posted its first profits in the first quarter of 2013, but developing a technology that could potentially transform one of the largest industries on the planet took quite a bit of R&D expense, so their lack of profits for the first decade of their existence was slightly misleading. In fact, over the past three years, Tesla has enjoyed a 158% annual compound growth rate Obviously, that sort of astronomical growth cannot continue indefinitely, but experts believe that this sort of steep trajectory could continue for years. The release of new car models, particularly those in more affordable price ranges for the average consumer, $30,000 to $40,000 versus $70,000 plus, as the prices initially were, make this clean, green automotive option widely attractive to an increasingly aware population that wants to diminish their carbon footprint and protect the environment for future generations. However, despite these impressive projections for the next coming years, many people are unaware of why Tesla deserves to sit firmly in the category of a growth engine. After all, there are already a few other companies that offer electric cars, and while the Tesla models do have longer ranges in terms of mileage per charge, their production can't keep up with the demand, and they have actually stopped taking orders in certain countries because of this disparity between supply and demand. That may not sound like the kind of company that deserves a growth engine label, but their skyrocketing share prices are not necessarily based on their cars, despite their vehicles being the stars in the public spotlight. Tesla Motors is building a Giga factory in Nevada, which will be operational in 2017. This massive factory will be able to produce up to 500,000 lithium-ion batteries per year, which is more than the entire planet's production in 2013. This monumental shift in subsequent production capacity will likely push Tesla from a novel gnat on the shoulder of the automotive industry to a full-fledged disruptive technology, and since the company is dedicating millions of dollars to lowering production costs of their vehicles, the electric car revolution is literally right around the corner. Savvy stock market minds know what is coming, and they are putting quite a few eggs in Tesla's proverbial basket. Not only will this massive increase in battery production enable Tesla to exponentially increase its output to the world, they are already looking into different applications for lithium-ion batteries, including smartphones, laptops, tablets, and other consumer products. This gigafactory is projecting a drop in the production costs for batteries by 30% in 2017 and by 50% in 2020 when the factory is fully operational. 
This will quite literally corner the market for some of the top industries in the world, most notably telecommunications. Tesla Motors has become the poster child for optionality, otherwise known as unquantifiable greatness. In a sense, Tesla is creating new markets and then immediately finding ways to dominate them, just as other modern giants such as Amazon have managed to accomplish. There is no limit to how high Tesla could soar or how great of an impact it could have on the functionality of countless industries across the globe. This makes Tesla one of the most impressive and attractive growth engines in the world today. Their advances are already intriguing enough to inspire billions of dollars of investment and stock market swings that are sending ripples of anxiety through the pool of long-established players in the automotive industry. Their disruptive presence shows no sign of slowing, and one underlying ace up their sleeve is their inherent role as the good guy in the market. By creating an enemy, a company inspires those millions of customers and loyal followers that love a good underdog story. Tesla has come along at the perfect time when the green revolution is spreading across the globe and automotive corporations are receiving black eyes for their role in the damage to the environment. Tesla has a built-in fan base, even if those customers have not, or will never, buy an electric car. They have posed themselves as the champion of sustainability and a selfless proponent of global change. This isn't a facade, either. Elon Musk has time and time again demonstrated his passion for positive global change, both with his SpaceX ventures and his powerful stances on artificial intelligence, green thinking, and open-source intellectual property rights. Tesla is headed by a man that has been compared to Henry Ford and Steve Jobs, a powerful combination of inspiring figures if there ever was one. Interestingly, though, Tesla Motors and their endless ambition to achieve the impossible is on track to improve the technologies of those two legendary figures and move the world into a more Chapter sustainable five, future. Plugging in the next generation. It seems that wherever you look in the world today, a screen is illuminating someone's face. Whether it is a student peering into a laptop in a coffee shop, a train commuter catching up on news via their smartphone, or someone flicking through Pinterest on their tablet in a waiting room, these modern gadgets have come to dominate the public's attention. Yet two decades ago, these glowing distractions didn't exist. This emerging industry has swept across the globe, and the total number of smartphones, tablets, laptops, and ultra-mobiles is expected to reach 2.5 billion units by 2015. This represents hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue, and every year, new models, accessories, upgrades, and related products draw in new users and additional profits. The amount of companies leaping onto this obvious bandwagon is practically incalculable, but the vast majority have directed their marketing and product design to mature users, students, professionals, and other adults who have a need for the functionality and connectivity that these devices provide. However, despite the debate over the impact of these devices on younger generations and their perception of the world, there is no denying that children are inherently intrigued by these technologies. Children learn by emulation of their elders. In past generations, children watched their parents reading newspapers and books, and this imprinted as a natural part of existence. This paradigm has shifted dramatically, and the effect of these new technologies on infants, toddlers, young adults, and teens is already a hotbed of academic and corporate research. Fuhu, a company based in El Segundo, California, was founded in 2007 and decided to leap into this potential market with both feet, even before the global phenomenon of tablets and smartphones had fully developed. Fuhu is the innovator of Nabi, a tablet specifically designed for children. Rather than letting children fumble blindly at an iPad or a smartphone, Fuhu decided to maximize that inherent fascination and provide a product for parents to customize their child's exposure to these technologies that will almost undoubtedly be a part of their children's development for many years to come. As a growth engine, Fuhu took a major risk, entering a market that was untested and unproven, but their bet has definitely paid off. 
They are only the second company in history to top the Inc. 500 list two years in a row. The Inc. 500 is an annual list of the fastest growing private companies in America, and Fuhu's exponential growth from 2012 to 2014 has shocked the market, to say the least. Boasting nearly 160,000% growth over the past three years, Boohoo is positioned to become the children's version of Apple, and while many critics said that this flash-in-the-pan success would fizzle, as so many other innovative companies jumping on the tablet bandwagon have done, Boohoo has grown laterally rather than trying to outdo itself with more products. Instead, it has begun producing more products, customizing them to different age groups and specific functions, and is now represented in over 15,000 retailers across the country with eyes on expanding into the international realm in the next year or two. Since 2011, the number of products has expanded from four to over 100, and its revenue has similarly swelled from a forgettable $1.6 million to over $200 million in sales. Following in the footsteps of Apple in many ways, the visionary leaders of Fuhu have tapped into the mind of their target market, giving respect to a demographic that is so often dismissed in industries outside of toys. Fuhu appeals to children with glow-in-the-dark covers and cases, stylized decals to personalize their knobby tablets, and even special edition tablets based on their personal interests – Nickelodeon, DreamWorks, Disney, etc. Every other company seems to design their products to appeal to the money spenders of the market – adults. However, Fuhu instead focuses on the users – children. This marketing and product design choice has resulted in record-breaking sales and nationwide appeal. Major technology giants offer different products to appeal to different users, and Fuhu follows that same framework. They have tablets for infants, toddlers, and tweens with complementary product add-ons and accessories specifically tailored to those age groups. They also understand that as their target audience grows up, they will need new models, creating the same sort of excitement that Apple and Microsoft followers experience when a new smartphone or tablet model is released. This sort of stepwise advancement through their product line guarantees a loyal following for over a decade if they begin as toddlers, so there is no reason why Fuhu can't rise to the same heights as their more publicly admired cousins in the tech field. Fuhu is a type of quiet growth engine that pursues a market demographic that has been overlooked for generations and has consequently risen to the top of their market in a very short time. It will take other companies years to establish the same sort of product range and retail availability, which means that Fuhu is unlikely to have any obstacles to growth for quite some time. If their growth thus far is any indication, 2015 projections are well over $400 million in sales, and they could very well top the Inc. 500 list for a third year in a row. By staying out of the arms race of adult-targeted technologies, they avoid competitors like Apple and Microsoft, easily dominating their corner of the market without having to compromise their company vision. Fuhu fits into the GSD category of growth engines, and they certainly get shit done. Their corporate culture is not nearly as flexible and free as Google. Instead, they require long hours, demand constant productivity, and pursue perpetual growth, knowing that a single misstep could spell disaster for their nascent empire. Fuhu also started first and planned later, knowing that getting a leg up on this market would be extremely important in the long run. Their infrastructure and retail connections are now so well established that pushing new products out of their pipeline is as simple as moving from drawing board to factories to shopping carts. Beginning with a single product put them in the public eye, effectively hooking their customers. From there, every other add-on and accessory was simply a matter of clever marketing and putting products where parents, and more importantly, children, Conclusion. could see them. Gods of Growth Whatever you choose to call them, growth engines, rising industry stars, growth machines, the innovators of tomorrow, they have managed to fascinate the market and draw impressive amounts of attention and revenue in a very short time. 
to say their methods are ingenious would be disingenuous they have simply chosen an ambitious path and stuck with it even in the face of criticism and doubt whether they will continue their reign is impossible to tell but that is the fickle and fascinating nature of business in the modern world will carrick green mountain eventually be bought out by coca-cola will tesla's expectation of dominance fall flat in the face of more established and powerful corporations can alibaba rise to global predominance in the western markets there is no way to predict how the fates of these companies will play out in the dynamic and competitive markets they've entered but for the time being their methods are solid and their returns are impressive in a world where money talks these growth engines have cooked up their own recipe for success and achieved what millions of other potential innovators can still only dream of following in their deep and influential footsteps is what so many other companies are trying to do but i would humbly suggest another path quite literally you should make your own path follow those companies instincts not their direction each of these growth engines has managed to achieve so much so quickly by going against the grain of accepted success and forged new paths blazed new trails and challenged the accepted forms of gradual growth to reach such exceptional heights of course an idea is the foundation of these stories a dream an ambition a wild fantasy that was somehow made manifest in the swirling pool of competition and commerce the initial keys to growth that were outlined in the opening pages of this short book are vague guidelines and philosophies for massive growth every company is different and every industry whether it currently exists or not will require a different nudge to rise to prominence however the principles of determination daring and discovery will always play a part in monumental growth these are only a handful of the companies that have defied expectations but the example that they have set of creative retail design international ambition ally acquisition environmental altruism and untapped demographic targeting are signposts on their own road to success they don't necessarily have to be yours these are merely my observations of the world as it stands today i will leave the summative wisdom to a far wiser man in the words of ralph waldo emerson a man ironically is unconnected to global markets and technological innovation as i can imagine do not go where the path may lead go instead where there is no path and leave a trail